I hope you're ready. This is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. And you may think that's weird because it's very dark. It's a very, you know, telling passage. But it's something that you need to understand because unless you understand this passage, you won't understand what's going on in this world. You won't understand what's going on with you. You won't understand the power of God that's actually working in you already. So we're in Ephesians chapter 2. Did you notice that? Hey, we have changed chapters. Brand new chapter. But notice how the apostle starts it out. He starts it out with the word and. So this is connected. There's really no chapter break here. It's the same passage just continued on into the next chapter. Uh, it says this, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, is there a greater statement than that, you know? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And it goes on. We need to remind ourselves what we were talking about because we've been in the middle of this prayer that Paul has been praying. He prayed that we might know what is the hope of our calling. I hope you guys are understanding that. Just this amazing grace that we have been called into and the hope that is there. And what is the riches of the inheritance have you guys been thinking about your future, where you're going, what God has done for you, where he's bringing you, where you're seated right now in the heavenlies with Christ? He's going to talk about that later. And then he talks about and the, the exceeding greatness of the power that works in us, works for us, that, that's already at work in the believer. And we looked at what that power looks like at the end of chapter 1, but now we take we take a, a whole new look at it, a whole new perspective of it, because we're going to look at what is the state of this world? What is the state of mankind since the fall? And you must bear in mind that everything that happens to a Christian happens because of the power of God in that Christian. But there's another power. There's another one out there. And, and we get kind of introduced to this. We get introduced to it in, in just this amazing way. And we must have our eyes open. We must have our spiritual intellect, you know, intact. We've got to pray that the Holy Spirit would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. We've got to have that spirit of wisdom and revelation because if you're not a believer, if, you, if you're just, I don't know, then this may not make sense to you. And what you need to do is you need to ask God, God, show me this. Reveal this to me. Make it real to me. Notice this opening statement. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. <laughs> God has overcome every obstacle to bring you to himself. <laughs> Even your dead condition. How do you do that? Through Christ Jesus. Through his life, his death, his blood his sacrifice, his resurrection, his ascension. And whose plan is this? Well, it is the Father's plan. It is God's plan, and it is his work. You know, we're going to read later on in, in verse 8, you know, that we are, or verse 10, we are his workmanship. We're his work. We're not our work. We're his work. 
so we gotta we gotta get to this place where we stop bragging we stop looking at ourselves with kind of a braggadocious spirit well uh, at least i'm a christian look at those other people out there they they don't even believe at least i believe in god they you know and we gotta stop doing that why do you believe because god gave you the power and the understanding to believe that's your only hope you know so it's all his doing it's a free gift to sinners it's a free gift to the ungodly so the apostle starts out today in this very dark place I don't know if you've ever been ring shopping. Anybody ever shop for a diamond ring for like your wife? You notice when you go in, you know, you go into Ingram's Jewelers or whoever, you know, and you, you I want to look at rings. And they always bring them out. Oh, let me bring them out. And they've got all of these little lights around, but they always put them on a very dark background. Have you noticed that? Why? Because they want that thing to sparkle. They want that thing to shine. That's what Paul wants to do with the gospel. That's what Paul wants to do with salvation. And so he paints this very dark background. But it's not just him painting it. He's describing reality. <laughs> so let's start our study in these first three verses. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, get this picture according to the course of this world this world has a course according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves so we were all there we have all walked this path fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the desires of our flesh and of our mind and we're by nature now notice this we're by nature children of wrath just as everybody else is notice Paul is speaking to the Ephesian church he's speaking to Christians he's speaking to believers they have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ they are saved they are sealed with the Holy Spirit and yet Paul knows this those guys are just babes in Christ those guys are just learning they're just getting their their feet under them they're just learning what Christianity is and Paul wants them to grow on to maturity to really get a hold of how great this salvation is and what, a, what an amazing message it is. And he wants them to understand fully the greatness of the power it took to bring them to the place that they are. You know, Paul will say in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Really what he's saying is, Man, I am so excited! I am so thrilled about it. But he uses that negative to really bring it out. And you go, well, why are you so excited about that, Paul? And he says, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of God. How do we measure that power? How do you understand what that power has really done? Well, first you've got to have spiritual eyes. Or else you'll reject it. You won't see the need for it. You won't see how glorious it is. So salvation always comes right to where you are. You don't have to move. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to do anything. Salvation always comes to you right where you are and then lifts us from that place and seats us with Christ in the heavenlies. That's a, that's a huge transition there. But some don't like the way Paul does this because he's going to start out very dark, very depressing, very ugly. Oh, I hate that stuff. Mark, I, I just want to be happy and joyful and positive. And I, I don't want to get into all that negative stuff. <laughs> I don't know if you understand this. God always uses the negative and the positive to get your attention. 
We'll never have a true concept of salvation if we don't have a true concept of sin and of the fall and of what has happened to mankind. Why must we be redeemed? You might ask that question. Why must we be born again? Why, why do we need to be saved? Why can't we just try a little harder and be a little better than I was yesterday and just, you know, kind of work my way into betterness? Why? Because there's this thing called sin. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You will never understand the incarnation of Christ. You will never understand the cross unless you understand what sin and the fall have done to mankind. Because the world is trying to lie to you every day. Oh, we're all good people. And well, as long as we try hard, and as long as we do good, and as long as we're, you know, nice, you're going to be just fine. We are good people. We are well-meaning people. We, we love one another. They can't even spell love. They have no idea what love even looks like, and yet that's what they're telling you. <laughs> I think it's funny. You have these bands, and they come out with these songs. Why can't we all just get along? Why can't we all just love one another? And there's five guys in the band, and they can't stay together for six months. What, what, what's your song, and what's your message? I, I don't get it. Why is man the way he is today? Why are there wars? Why is there widespread hunger? Why is there a food crisis right now? Billions of people on planet Earth don't know where their next meal is coming from. Do you realize that today? India, Africa, there's a huge shortage of food going on. Think about Afghanistan. You think about all of these places. That, I can't think of the name of the place, the place where Russia invaded. Ukraine. Ukraine. There is shelter and clothing and food shortages, and they're coming into winter just like we're coming into winter. Why, why, why would that go on in, in a nice, pleasant, loving world? Why, the Bible says, why are people hateful and hating one another. I watch stupid shows. I watch Wicked Tuna. Okay? Got these bunch of idiots out on boats and they're catching big fish, you know. And you know what I see them doing? This guy over here will catch a tuna and everybody else in the fleet, that jerk, I hate him. <laughs> they're friends. But they're hateful and they're hating one another. Why are you... Why am I so self-centered? <laughs> Why can't we all just get along? Well, Mark, I think it's a lack of education. You know, if people just knew the reality of the thing. We live in the most educated society the world has ever known. And America is worse than it's ever been. It's not education. It's sin. It's sin. We've got to go back to the real issue, right? The fact that mankind fell. Genesis chapter 3. When the Bible talks about life, it, it faces the facts head on. It's a book of reality. Let's look at what really happened. Man is an idiot. I, I mean, man is a fool. I, I don't know how you say that. We have brought all of this junk we see around us upon ourselves. And it, Paul says it's because mankind, we, everyone in these chairs, we are sons of disobedience. <laughs> Oh, just have somebody tell you no about something. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't go in that door. I'm sorry, I'm going in that door. Is, does that work the same way with you? Oh, wet paint. I wonder if it's really wet. Oh, look, it's wet. 
don't no fishing here that's where they hide all the good fish wonder how I could did your brain work that way because my brain works that way all the time do you know what that is right it's just because you're a bad person it's sin and it and there's no hope for mankind until he realizes that and when you first realize that that's the first step of repentance because you could begin to change the way you think show me someone in this world who boasts about their morality about their goodness and their good works and their love for other people and I will show you an unrepentant sinner <laughs> you're a liar because I know what goes on inside of your heart because it goes on inside of my heart I know what goes inside of your mind because it goes on inside of my mind the reality is man has fallen man is sinful man is corrupted and we are helpless and we are hopeless in this world we come out of the factory slaves of sin and that truth when you first face that truth it um, it'll break you it's very humiliating it's very humbling oh how hard it is to get over that stone of stumbling that is you can't do anything for yourself you're broken and you're empty and you can't help it <laughs> that's why most people won't accept that oh but mark you don't understand me I'm a, I'm a good person compared to so-and-so I'm really a nice guy you know <laughs> what cracks me up about that thing is they're, they're blind to a couple of things. First, your comparison is wrong because you're comparing yourself with the guy next to you or with the lady across the street. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong comparison. Compare yourself to the Son of God. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now you can compare all you want. Just go for it. Compare. <laughs> because, you know, when you get done comparing, you will sit there speechless and guilty before God. Because none are righteous, no, not one. And then your definition of good is wrong. Oh, I'm a good person. You know, a guy came up to Jesus one day and said, hey, good teacher. And, and Jesus interrupts him right there. Why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God. Oh, you're, you're saying I'm a good person. You're saying you're a God person? You're saying you're equal with God? I'm sorry, it says, all have fallen short. All have fallen short. Hmm. See, the biblical truth is more pessimistic. It's more depressing. But at the same time, it's more optimistic than any other worldview out there. You know, mankind sits around. Can a utopian society actually exist? How come we can't seem to make it? You know, we bring in the finances. We have the money. We have the, all the tools, all the toys, all the houses, all the stuff. We have everything that anybody could ever want and ever desire. Is it utopia? No, it's the worst that's ever been. So it's very pessimistic. But at the same time, it's the only truly optimistic truth that there is. Because though we are sinners and though we are dead spiritually, though we are separated from God and though we are in this condemned place, yet there is a God who has a power to take you from that place and bring you to himself. <laughs> to raise you up to the heavens with him. That's what we're going to talk about. So the apostle in these first three verses gives us four basic main topics, if you will. Firstly, he describes man 
in that sinful state. This is what sin looks like. Secondly, he explains that sinful state and why man is there. Thirdly, he tells us what this sinful state leads to. This is where you're going. This is where you're headed. And fourthly, what's, what God's view of man in that state is. So what is man's condition in sin? Dead. That's man's condition in sin. <laughs> and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Let me read this in another way because you might notice if you have a Bible in your hands, you might look down at your Bible and you'll say, and you, and then he made alive is in italics, which means it's not in the original. They added those words to try to make it flow, try to make it read right. Now, it's going to say that in a few verses, but it really doesn't say it here. Let me read it like this. And you who were dead. <laughs> Boy, that, that cuts right through it, right? And it's not in trespasses, but on account of trespasses, on account of sin. It's you're dead because you were doing this. And that word dead, doesn't it just stick out to you? Well, I'm not dead. Dead means no life. Dead means dead, you know? Of course he's dealing with spiritual deadness, not physical here. He's teaching us that the life of the unbeliever is a living death. It's an existence without meaning, without purpose, without hope, without life. Notice how strong that word is, dead. If someone to, were to walk up to you and go, you are dead. There is no life in you whatsoever. That would kind of be get in your face, wouldn't it? So what does he mean by dead? He means the exact opposite of life. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So death is the opposite of that. Death is not knowing God, not knowing his son Jesus Christ, not knowing eternal life, and not knowing God's plan or the gospel. The opposite of that is dead. God is the author of life. So life is to know God, to be in a relationship with him, to enjoy him, to correspond with him, to relate to him, to live with him, to share his life with him. So you can define death as the opposite of that. Ephesians 2.12 That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants and promises, having no hope and without God in the world that's dead. The second thing this verse tells us, or this passage tells us, is that the dead man is ignorant of spiritual things, of godly things. Romans 8, 5 says the same thing. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. So what it tells us is these dead people, these unsaved people, they set their minds, they pursue in this life the things of this world. Money, sex, alcohol, lifestyle, position. They have their minds consumed with that. But the Christian, you run across a Christian and they're like, Man, I just listened to the sermon the other day. You what? I was just reading in my Bible yesterday. You, you what? You see where they're pursuing? 
and the world. The world looks at you and shakes his head and goes, oh man, that stuff is so boring. Are you kidding me? You read that Bible. I, I tried that one time. <sighs> Mercy, you know? I got like two chapters in. They can't help it. They can't see anything in it. They don't have eyes to see it. They won't understand it. They've got no draw to it. So they don't just find it boring. You might notice this. They actually want to fight against it. They want to fight against you. They hate spiritual things. And of course, some of them still want their religion as long as they can kind of control that religion. Well, we want to control what you preach and how you preach it. And you hear him say, well, I really like my church. I go there and it makes me feel good. I, I got news for you, man. You read the Bible. You read it seriously. And there are times you walk away from that not feeling too good. Romans 8, 7, it says, because the carnal mind, that natural mind, that one that came out of the womb, is enmity, and enmity means at war with, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. You know, you, you want an example of this. Modern example. Take that program called The Chosen, that mini-series that's going on now about Jesus, and uh, it's beautifully done. There's great characters in it. You know, they, they've really, you know, it's interesting, it's fun, it, it's scenery is great. You, you get all of this background, all of this stuff. And I've heard these rave reviews. Oh, Mark, you got to watch that because, you know, I'm learning so much about Jesus and I'm seeing so much about this and so much about that. But, but uh, you know, I've even had pastors at a pastor's conference tell me, oh, man, you need to watch that. It's so op eye-opening and it's so plain and so clear. It's a must-watch. So Brendan and I sat down last year and we watched a few of the first series, you know. And it left me wanting. It was interesting because I noticed, the first thing I caught was every time Jesus did a miracle, they had changed the location. They, they did the miracle under different circumstances and they changed the outcome of the, mir the miracle, the, the meaning, the parable of the miracle. They had you focusing on the wrong things. And I, I, I was questioning that. They had twisted them all. They had some scenes and some places where they had Jesus doing unbiblical things. And I was scratching my head going, what? I, I, you know, and they want to write that off as, well, we have to add life. We have to ad lib in a bunch of stuff to make this a series, to make this a movie. And my question is, how do you add life to the living Word of God? That's an impossible thing. And then two days ago, Jonah contacted me and he goes, hey, have you watched the, the Series 3 trailer for The Chosen? I said, no. And he goes, oh, they have Jesus doing this. And so I brought up the Season 3 trailer and I watched it. And sure enough, they have Jesus proclaiming, I am the law of Moses. Now, Jesus has a lot of I am statements in the Bible. It's amazing. That's not one of them. And, and I scratch my head and I go, what's going on with that? Oh, you know where that statement came from. Book of Mormon. So I guess if you're one of the financiers of this program that goes on, you have the right to stick words in Jesus' mouth. They have turned this Jesus into an anti-Jesus. I hope you catch my drift there. They have turned this Jesus into someone who's standing in the place of Jesus. Many people think he's Jesus, but he's leading you away from Jesus.
But the world loves it. The world can't get enough of it. Why? Because it's a Jesus that they can make do what they want to do and say what they want it to say. Isn't that sad? But it's true. That is a wolf in sheep's clothing. That is strange fire if you, if you know your Old Testament. And Jesus would tell us this. Take heed that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. They use the image of Jesus and his name to deceive. Hmm. So our world likes a Jesus they can control. Our, our world likes a Jesus, a religion that makes them feel good. But Paul goes on and he says, but these outside of Christ, these non-believers, they, uh, they are corrupt. And it's an interesting word. And they're growing more and more corrupt daily. And, and I don't want to ruin your breakfast or anything, but just think of a dead and then think of it corrupting. That's the picture. They delight in evil. They delight in their dirty jokes, in their immoral conversations, their impure thoughts. After a big weekend being drunk and chasing girls and stuff, they will come back to the tribe at work and they'll share every detail of what happened that weekend. And they're proud of it. They gloat about their dirty deeds, you know. Such a life is outside of God, therefore he can't bless it, so their life is miserable. And they spend most of their time trying to get away from self. How do you do that? Well, you go to happy hour on Friday night. How do you do that? Well, sex, drugs, rock and roll, gets to the point where suicide comes in. Do you realize that that is what you are and who you are by nature? That is how you came out of the factory of your mother's womb. Brought forth in sin, conceived in iniquity. That is why we must be saved. That is why you must be set free, you must be born again, you must have a new start. Are you beginning to see the measure of the power of God it took you to get you to sit here and to listen to this and to hear it? He's brought you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So let's look at that second statement. Ephesians 2.2 in which you once walked according to the course of this world. It's it's literally written according to the age of this world. Hey, we're new age people. Hey, we're 21st century people. Hey, we're this century people, you know. People are governed by the things and ways of this world. Have you noticed that? Here's the thing. This world controls your thinking. Let me mention one word, evolution. It controls your thinking. Let me mention another word, science. Education. The idea that God is love. Now God is love, but that is not all that he is. But they want that to be all that he is. Oh, Mark, we've evolved past our need for an ancient God like that who punishes and is mean and, you know, carries around a big baseball bat with him so he can thump you alongside the head. And, you know, marriage is just a piece of paper, Mark. It really doesn't mean anything. Sin doesn't really separate me. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure sin exists. I just want to live my life. Understand this world 
according to the course of this world. That world is defined as a mentality and the organization of man apart from God. That's this world. Have you noticed our world shutting God out of places? I don't know. It's been going on for, you know, hundreds of years, but we've kicked him out of government. We've kicked him out of the schools. We've kicked him out of sporting events. Heck, most churches have kicked him out of church. You go there, they won't preach the word. They don't mention, you know, God is love. Let's just all hold hands and get along. Man now controls his destiny, and we decide what's right and wrong. No wonder the apostle writes in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable spiritual act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. It's literally, it's stop being pressed into the mold of this world. <laughs> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, do you have a mind that needs renewed? Because I do. Oh, it's just brainwashing. Yep, and my brain needs washing. Lots of it. Stop being squeezed into this world's mold. Get a biblical mind, mindset. 1 John 2, 15 says, do not love the world. What was our definition of the world? All of this stuff that wants to just be man without God. Organizations without God. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but of the world. And the world is passing away. The world is corrupting away. And the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Isn't it so sad as you as a Christian walk around this world and you see people buying into what this world is selling? Their whole life is about everything that's going on here in the now. Their appearance is controlled by what this world thinks. I've got to have the latest fashions. I've got to dress like this. I've got to be like this. I've got to wear my hair like that. Their speech is controlled by what this world expects. You're a sailor? You've got to talk like a sailor. You're a tough man? You've got to talk like a tough man. They're falling into the mold of this world. They conform because they dare not not conform. Oh, well, I'm going to be a rebellious guy. I'm going to get a tattoo. Well, that's that's okay. People have gotten tattoos. Oh, I'm going to be I'm going to be goth. I'm just going to wear black and and kind of check out. Uh, that's okay. It's on the menu. You can do that. I'm going to be straight edge. Back when you know I first got saved. Yeah. But they're sim simply just picking from the menu of this world. And that would be bad enough if it stopped there, but Paul wants to take you a bit deeper. Ephesians 2.2, 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. There is a spiritual principle upon this planet. All of creation. I don't know if you remember in Genesis chapter 3, but we live in a fallen and a cursed world. And it's not just our world, it's us. We are fallen and we are cursed. But now there is a spiritual entity, a spiritual power that energizes, empowers the sons of disobedience. Understand, sin is not passive. Sin is active and it is being activated by the prince of the power of the air. <laughs> by Satan. By the devil. 
You know, he's the God of this age, the Bible tells us. He's the God of this world. So that should totally change your mind when you're looking at the world. Why is that fool doing that? Oh, rewind Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1, 2, or Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Why is that guy doing that? Because he is being dominated. He is being controlled and empowered by Satan. Do you understand that? Do you understand what he's saying there? The devil is so cunning and so subtle that the whole time he's controlling somebody, he makes that person believe he's being set free. I'm going to shake off this God thing and shake off this thing and these laws and these rules and I'm going to live my own life and the whole time he's thinking he's living his own life Satan has him absolutely under control <laughs> when they're turning their back to God thinking they're being set free Satan's weaving his web around him the whole time think about how the Bible tells that God motivates you he gives you the will and the desire to do his good pleasure, the Bible says. So these poor lost souls are being energized to do Satan's bidding. And yet the whole time thinking they're just normal people. Oh, I'm good and I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm basically a good person. Oh, the subtle deception of Satan. He has an invisible army with him. And they are single-minded about this thing. To deceive. To convince people that they don't need God. That they don't need the God of the Bible. They don't need Jesus. They don't need the crucifixion. They don't need born again. They don't need God. Anything but God. Oh, you want the chosen? Yeah, yeah, watch the chosen. That's great. Oh, oh you want your religion? Yep, that's, that's great. Have your religion. Oh, you want a higher power? Yep, have a higher power. You want your God out in nature? Yep, have at it. It's great. That's why there's all these false religions out there. Ephesians 6.12, Paul tells us the truth. For we do not wrestle, we do not fight against flesh and blood. We're not in some battle with our neighbor. We're not in some battle with, you know, other people. But against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We wrestle against a spiritual enemy, an unseen enemy. If you think, you walk around and you just think this world is just good people and bad people. You just think there's some people that have self-control. And there's some people that don't have any self-control. If that's the way you look at this world, you are deceived. <laughs> For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no not one. Why? Because we all came into this world through Adam's blood, cursed, under sin. And we all choose daily to sin. Oh, Mark, that seems harsh. No. Sometimes it takes me upwards of 10, 15 minutes after I get up in the morning to sin. We're sons of the devil and we are sons of disobedience out of the factory. You must be born again to become a son of God. This prince of the power of the air. Prince of the power of the air. That, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? And it could mean several things. It could mean, you know, of this present darkness. 
It could mean of this atmosphere, of this air. Everything around the planet. I personally kind of like that one. Don't know. Or it could mean of these unseen powers. So the tragedy of man is because he can't see these unseen powers, he doesn't believe in them. They laugh off this idea about Satan, about the devil. <laughs> yeah, some guy with a red suit and pitchfork and, you know, horns. And yeah, you should laugh that off, right? Because he can't see the Holy Spirit, he doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Because he can't see God, he doesn't believe in God. Because he can't see the spiritual realm, he doesn't believe there's a spiritual realm. When you die, you die. They are without spiritual understanding. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. They're unseen. They're, just show me. Give me a proof. If God is real, let him strike me with lightning. Like that would do you any good. Then you're dead and it's over. You know? For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. Did you catch that? They can not know them because they are spiritually discerned and they don't have the spirit. Oh, the power of this evil. The unbeliever says, show me and I will believe. And God says, believe and I will show you. Because I can't show you unless my Holy Spirit's in you. I can't make it real to you unless you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And that only comes through salvation. So he says, believe, and you see it all. I, I want to see it first. I'm from Nebraska, and we're the show-me state, you know? But for the believer, it's so different. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. God has given us eyes. God has given us ears. We have received the Holy Spirit. The one who wrote the book now speaks the book to us, makes it real to us. So should us as believers, should we as believers now just kick back and relax? Well, I'm, I'm safe. Cool. Never. Not for a moment on this planet. Because we are in this fallen world. And we know there are evil powers at work and that evil power is constantly trying to get you to rebel constantly trying to get you to sin constantly trying to get you to sit back and relax he's constantly perverting your thoughts have you ever noticed that He's constantly bringing ugly pictures into your mind. He's twisting our actions. He's misusing our relaxation. And the whole while, the rest of the world is being herded into hell. Let me put it like this. If Satan was bold enough to walk up to Jesus Christ, our Lord, face to face and tempt him if thou art the son of God if you think this turn this into that or do this are you foolish enough to think he's not going to stand up to you walk right up to your face and tempt you and how's he going to do it well he's going to use your friends he's going to use your family He's going to use your loved ones. He's going to use the lust that is already inside of you. Satan has been watching what you watch. Oh, look at, look at his eyes when that comes on the screen. Oh, look at, look at how he watches that. Hmm. He's even going to use your will. I really want to go do this. 
wow, did you run that by God first, or is this just your will? Because if it's your will, you're in trouble. How does the believer stand in a world like that? There's only one answer to that. It is the exceeding greatness of the power that now works in us. That is the only thing that is holding you right now. The God who saves us is the God who keeps us. Aren't you happy about that? You know, Jesus would say, you're in my hand. No one can get you out of my hand. And then he would say, oh, and besides that, you're in God's hand. And no one, no one can get you out of the Father's hand. So as you sit here, let me just ask you a question. Do you know he has quickened you? Do you know he has made you alive? Are you hearing spiritual things? Are you seeing spiritual things? Are you understanding spiritual things? Then you're not dead, are you? God has brought you to life. And if he has quickened you, then you need to trust him. That his power will never leave you. It will never forsake you. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is where the Christian stands. Come hell or, or high water, I stand in Christ Jesus because I'm hanging on to him? No. Because he's hanging on to me. I stand there because he has begun this work and he will complete this work and all my hope is in him. If Mark Paulson, if you're there, and Mark Paulson ever comes into the doors of heaven, you turn around and you praise Jesus because it certainly isn't because I made it there. It's because he drug me there. Oh, Father. How do we but praise your name? How do we but, but just stand up and say thank you, praise you? God, you who have taken me from the darkness of this chapter from the darkness of being reigned over and ruled over and in slavery to sin and to Satan, you've brought me out of that. You've brought me into the kingdom of the Son of your love. And I have nothing to fear. But I have much to do. Because everybody I've ever known, all my friends, all my work, cohorts all my family oh Lord Jesus they need you oh Father open their eyes oh God save oh God open their ears that they might see that they might hear that they might understand and be saved God, help us to share. Help us to care. Help us to love the way that you loved when you so loved the world that you gave. You gave of everything you had. Lord, drive us to that place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.